Another crucial action, but one that is very difficult to rationalize scientifically, is the action of the alterative. And um, just as an example, one of my favorite alteratives is Clevis, Galea maparini. It's a really wonderful plant. Some of the books today still use the old definition of an alterative, which was a blood cleanser, which causes more, that definition causes more problems than it than it needs to. If you had dirty blood, you'd have septicemia and you need to go to an emergency room. It's not literally cleaning of the blood. It's altering the body towards health. Um, they're used in problems where the underlying cause of the pathology is something systemic, like psoriasis or eczema. Um, they're used as core body metabolism manipulators in all rain, ranges of, of conditions. And it's a, a property that orthodox medicine doesn't recognize. Um, but I think it's a property that we have to acknowledge that we don't really know how they work or what they're doing, but they do work. So alteratives, some of them are very strong and I never use them. The, these are the herbs, the eclectics and physiomedicals handed to us that were the, basically the purge and puke herbs. Um, and that's just not, not my approach. I use them for, as I said, skin problems and, and sometimes as part of, um, of arthritis, musculoskeletal treatments. We have two groups of them. Well, we have many different ways of, of categorizing them, but there are the, uh, the green leafy ones, which tend also to be diuretics and tend to be gentler than the rootier ones, which tend to be hepatic, tend to work on the liver, and tend to push the body a little bit more. So um, the choice of the right alterative gets to be uh, pivotal in some situations. The safest ones, and um, always effective to some degree, may not be effective enough in, skin, in, in adult skin conditions, are going to be cleavers, um, red clover nettles, um, widely available, very safe herbs, very useful herbs. Uh, when I was in clinical practice in, um, in Wales, one of the traditional approaches that um, I discovered in the old books, because there are, no, there are no representatives of the old physicians of Mithvai, who were the Welsh herbalists, they, they, the whole tradition died out in the end of the 19th century. I actually followed it through to the last representative. So, you know, I was one and a half generations, two generations late. Um, but what they would do in the spring, um, if you wanted a spring tonic, or if um, you were treating eczema or, or psoriasis, you get an earthenware container, and they always emphasized earthenware, and it may well be that that was important in this. I, I just don't know. Get an earthenware container, pick lots of cleavers and break it up with your hand and put it in the earthenware so it fills it up and then pour spring water in because um, there'll be lots of space for the water to go. Leave it for at least 12 hours. Now in Wales that would always have been cold so it wouldn't go off. If you're in a hot climate you need to keep it definitely cool. And then the liquid that you just pour off, that should be your only drink for a month. And it's actually quite tasty. Um, so it was a really good, practically doable way of getting large amounts of alteratives in people. Um, doing that would clear eczema in, in most children. Um, I saw it working usually. Um, They get really specific. The flowers have different, I don't know whether you can see them, very, very, very small wind pollinated flowers. Um, they have different properties to the whole of the plant. The seeds here with the little hooks on them, they're supposed to have different properties. But, you know, I have to own up to being a herbalist from London. I'm not going to get fiddly enough to pick those little white flowers. That's why herbalists have apprentices. They get the apprentice to do all the work, but that just seems like slave labor to me, so I don't have apprentices. Um, I would think of this sort of 
green alterative, as I said, for skin conditions, but then this one specifically for swollen lymph glands. And any situation where you feel that there should be um, um, a cleansing process in the lymphatic system. Um, it also had a role to play in traditional approaches for cancer. Another one of the, um, the green leafy alteratives that's now actually a big issue in, um, in the natural products industry is red clover, trifolium pratens. And this is a place where you have to be very careful with, the, uh, with plant ID. Um, make sure you get the right plant. I've seen this plant achieve incredibly rapid and complete reversals of childhood eczema, especially um, atopic eczema associated with, with asthma. Of course, it's got to be in the context of appropriate diet and lifestyle, but very, very useful plant. This was part of the traditional Welsh cancer poultice um, as well. It would be combined with, with nettles um, and burdock. Um, used for breast cancer and also lymphatic cancers. And not a miracle cure, but definitely has a, a lot to offer. This plant will also be relaxing for young children, children under the age of seven, or maybe you know older children if they're, they're small and delicate constitutions. It doesn't relax adults at all really. Um, makes a very useful addition to um, a bath. Say you had a hyperactive child. Um, if you make a strong, well, basically you boil this up on a stove in a, in a saucepan and then just pour that liquid into the bath. Hang out in the bathroom with them um, and they're having fun in the water. By the time they come out of the bath and you're drying them off, they're ready to go to sleep. Even if they're hardcore hyperactive, this is going to help them. Now, a confusing issue about this plant is that the, uh, the German pharmaceutical industry um, worked out that it was a very rich and economically cheap source of phytoestrogens. So there's a bunch of products on the market now which contain um, very concentrated standardized extracts of this, which are supposed to be the treatment for hot flushes that herbal medicine came up with. Not true, not at all, not in any way. That's the, um, the natural products part of the pharmaceutical industry coming up with a rich phytoestrogen source, which they then make a bunch of claims for. And yes, it works to some degree, but that insight did not come from herbalists. Uh, it came from test tubes, putting it crudely. Um, I would much rather be using Vitex and other you know, uterine tonics or hormonal normalizers than using this as a, um, as a phytoestrogen source. It's an example to me of where we herbalists have got to be really up on our tradition so that we can see the misinformation coming and not just buy into it because the PhDs are saying this works for hot flushes doesn't mean we should stop what we did traditionally and then move into what the, um, the white coats say. Yes, it works, but Vitex works better. So this is another multi-action plant. It's an alterative. Um, it's a lymphatic tonic. It's a mild relaxing nervine, and it's a phytoestrogen source.